was too busy ruining the Roman Empire to designate an heir. When his time came, he brought his dynasty with him. Without opposition, one of the key men behind the revolt that brought about Nero's downfall assumed the throne. Servius Sulpicius Galba was born on December 24th, 3 BC. While not a Julio-Claudian, the young aristocrat was favored by Rome's early emperors, facilitating a rapid political rise. After breaking into the Senate at a comically young age, Galba notably became consul under Tiberius and a general under Caligula. But from his Neronian governorship in Spain, he would revolt. By 68 AD, Nero's rule had crippled Rome. Galba heeded Gaius Vindex's call to rebellion, mustered his Spanish troops, grabbed his buddy Otho, and advanced toward the capital. While Vindex himself was defeated, Galba convinced Nero's Praetorian Prefect to have his men abandon the Mad Emperor. A mortified Nero took his own life shortly thereafter. Galba was now the Emperor. Sworn in by the Senate in June, the gout-ridden disciplinarian would see his reign come crashing down after just seven months. Faced with undoing Nero's lavish spending, Galba did what he had to do. He cut funding for public spectacles, drained wealth from conquered towns, and refused to pay the Praetorians who made him emperor in the first place. Uh-oh. Despite the budget cuts, Galba definitely made sure to compensate the Gallic troops who had fought under Gaius Vindex. This was the final straw for the two German legions who had just defeated these guys. They revolted, hailing their commander Vitellus as an emperor. Never mind that. Galba had bigger problems even closer to home. Remarkably, he did not choose Otho as his heir. Enraged, Otho bribed the Praetorians to kill the old man on the 15th of January, 69 AD. If you thought Galba's reign was short, Otho's tenure was a measly eight weeks. Overwhelmed by the Principate and forced into conflict, Otho killed himself to save the Empire. Marcus Salvius Otho was born on April 20th, 32 AD. Dealt a politically active father only occasionally present to deliver a flogging, a mischievous young Otho grew up unchecked. He found a bro in the equally chaotic Nero, with whom he became very close. In regards to romance, though, it was thoroughly hoes before bros for Nero. He took Otho's beloved Papaea Sabina for himself, and then exiled the poor schmuck to a Lusitanian governorship. After actually doing his job for ten years, Otho, nonetheless eager for revenge, tagged along with Galba to overthrow Nero. Despite his best efforts to endear himself to everyone, a now debt-ridden Otho was still snubbed as Galba's heir. He desperately needed money. The Principate was the answer. So he made one more bribe to the Praetorians. After securing the throne on January 15th, 69 AD, a conflict-hating Otho made it his mission to appease absolutely everyone. That, and rather surprisingly, restoring Nero's legacy. While ruling with integrity, Otho certainly did bring back Number Five's lavish spending, seemingly paying off the Praetorians every week. He even granted 50 million sesterces towards finishing Nero's Golden Palace. Despite a relatively calm rule in Rome, there was still the issue of the renegade wannabe emperor Vitellius. Otho tried diplomacy, offering Vitellius a share of his imperial dignity, but Otho's outstretched olive branch was thrusted right back into his face. War it was. Otho's army, not yet at full strength, clashed with Vitellius's men near Bedriacum. Despite still having plenty of men to call upon, Otho, upon hearing of the defeat, decided to kill himself to avoid more bloodshed. Signaling the end of the post-Neronian chaos, the eight-month emperor Vitellius would fall to the man who made researching this video so damn hard. Saying Aulus Vitellius had an easy career would be an understatement. Born in September 15 AD, the son of a rock star politician, he predictably shot up the cursus honorum. After Galba removed the treacherous Lucius Rufus from his Germanic governorship, he called upon Vitellius to fill the void. 
This proved to be a fatal lapse in judgment, as Vitellius inadvertently won the unwavering loyalty of the uppity German legions, so much so that they hailed their governor as emperor in January 69 AD. Well, surely a purple toga couldn't hurt. Vitellius was now committed in his bid for the Principate. Dispatching two military columns, not even the ascension of a new emperor, Otho, could stop Vitellius's military advance. Having ample imperial power bestowed upon him by the Senate on April 30th and arriving in Rome soon after, the newly dubbed Forever Consul endeared himself to pleb and patrician alike through public games and allowing the equites to become imperial civil servants. Despite soaring popularity in the West, by July, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, a general largely without a contemporary rival and fueled by prophecies for his own principate was drumming up support in the east. Worse yet, Otho's Danubian legions were sympathetic to Vespasian's cause, swiftly moving towards the capital. Thanks to some treachery on the part of a Vitellian general and two devastating military defeats, Vespasian's men had reached Rome itself by December 19th, taking the city after two days of urban warfare. In desperation, Vitellius blockaded himself in the Golden Palace disguising himself for good measure. No amount of golden girdles could save the emperor from fate, however. He was stripped, tortured, and ultimately tossed into the Tiber River. After more than a year of civil war and three pitifully short-lived emperors, from the bloody ashes of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, a new princeps finally rose. Titus Flavius Vespasianus. Vespasian was born on November 17th, 9 AD. Initially expressing disinterest in politics, he was eventually ushered up the political ladder after relentless maternal taunting. Eventually, he gained enough imperial trust to be granted an army of 60,000 to quash a revolt in Judea. He would not remain in his older brother's shadow for long. After the death of Nero in 68 AD, Vespasian stopped fighting his Jewish war and began to secretly hatch a plot with the governor of Syria, Mucianus. While swearing loyalty to Five's first two successors, when Vitellius won the Principate, it was go time. Declarations of loyalty rang loud out east, and a pleasant surprise came in August 69 AD when the Danubian legions also hopped on board. Vespasian moved to Egypt to cut the Roman grain supply. Then he waited. Vespasian's men ultimately won. The Senate declared him emperor following the storming of Rome on December 21st, 69 AD. But Vespasian told them to cut the bullshit. He had actually been emperor since July. A war-torn Rome needed a strong leader, so Vespasian conferred upon himself a fully naked autocracy. His prime objective? Recouping 40 billion sesterces of debt. He worked towards this end by manipulating markets, doubling tribute, and even taxing urine. The habitually generous Vespasian did give back to Rome, however, beginning work on the Colosseum. After a 10-year reign, Vespasian would break with recent precedent one more time, becoming the first emperor to die of natural causes since Augustus himself. The bedridden but nevertheless occupied emperor eventually met his end to a violent bowel movement in late June 79 AD.